Sometimes we see great examples of Scripture lived out before us. That's what we're talking about today in Lessons from the Book of James in VBS. We're in the Book of James, and we're doing Authentic Faith. Today the title is a little different, Lessons from James in VBS. And you may think this is a cheat. It's a little strange for me, but the more I prayed about this, the more I kept feeling like I should share with you some lessons that I saw. Some of you saw them yourselves. Others, many of you weren't here. But I hope that you can learn from them. Um, so this is less... Ex- more praise. <laughs> more exegesis and a little more application, looking at some life things that happen. I hope you can appreciate it. We will be in the book of James, chapter 1, so if you want to go there, I would encourage you to follow along and call me out if there's something that you think I'm too far off base on. But I think there's a lot of practical applications. Now, when we, we're we going to go through 1, 2, to chapter 2, verse 1. Um, I'm going to read a lot of those uh, verses, not all of them, because I'm just trying to emphasize some of the highlights, and I'm going to use VBS as an example. And remember, part of what we're seeing is the nature of the fruit we talked about in the past. Galatians 5, if you want to cross-reference, Galatians 5 says, here's what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is at work in life. Here's what it looks like when the flesh is at work. And those are dramatically different things. Remember, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. That's what you see when the Holy Spirit's at work. All the dissension, disruption, lying, cheating, murder, is what you see in the human heart without God at work. And James has called us when we last discussed to not just be hearers, not just to hear that word and go, well, that was a good word, but to live out that word, which means submitting ourselves to God, being a doer who is in relationship with God. And I love the way that it's written here, with the word implanted within us. That's Jesus, and that's God's word, the Bible as well, and submitting to God's transformation. A doer seeks to follow that example, follow Jesus, who was all that we just talked about with the kids in terms of sent by God to show his love for us and to make a way that we can be in relationship with him. But we're, you know, the Holy Spirit's at work transforming us. The Bible is there to help in that process. And I can tell you that I saw an abundance of the fruits of the Spirit at VBS, and the kids did too. Because where the kids were loved, and the truth was shared, the kids responded. One of the things that we saw this week, that in the time since 2019, since I've been involved with BBS here, we have not seen, is we saw more boys come each day. Um, and I think that's in part because it wasn't just all about the rules, and it wasn't all about being polite. Yeah, we tried to get them to play well with each other, that's fine, and they did pretty well. But it was about showing them the love of God in a meaningful way, having some fun, telling them the truth, and seeing guys especially do it. You know, ladies, some of you know, mother death uh, in in your kids, right? And with kids who, many of them around here have little contact with a biological dad or a foster dad, and so those are really important too. And that part of that affects how we see God, right? And so when God's at work, he can, it's love in one form or another. Um, that we see at work. The kids really responded. But we saw more girls too. What we started the week with and what we ended with, it just kept growing and that was exciting. Now, as we start reading, you know, there's the introduction with James and then in verse one, uh, chapter one, verse two, that one of the most challenging things in scripture, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, by the way, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. How do I have joy in trials? Well, remember we talked about it. It's not happiness. It's joy that comes from knowing that God is at work, what God has done, that God loves us, and so much more than we have hope in Him. That's how we can have joy, even when things are unpleasant. Now, here is some of the normal chaos in games, right? And they're having a great time, and you can't see it, but that actually is a form of tag that went along with one of the lessons. And later, I missed it, but pretty soon you're going to see multiple groups have linked arms and they're actually working together. Um, I think it was called cluster tag. It was pretty fun. A lot of times life looks like that to us, right? That chaos that's going on around us, and we don't see the order. But as we trust God, and as the trials of life happen, knowing that God is there even when we're in the midst, 
That's how faith is produced, because we see him work. We see him answer prayer like we just talked about. We see him answer things that we never prayed for. Maybe somebody else prayed for us, or we just desperately need it because he provides. And as we see that, as we grow in faith, we grow more steadfast in knowing God is there. Now, we had a real opportunity this last week to have a trial. And to me, this really exemplified the difference between Christ followers that James is talking about and church people. Most of you who have interacted with church people know that they are very good about the rules and they often play very well. Well, they put on a good show when they're in church, but life in church and life outside of church look very different, right? And, but Christ followers look pretty much the same inside and outside. Christ followers tend to, they know the rules, but they're much more interested in the relationships and people and where God is working. And you can see the difference when things are going on and when things go wrong. Now, here's the opportunity that we had, and some of you may have had this opportunity, but every day after, after we did BBS, we did a hot wash. We talked about what went well, what we need to work on for the next day, and we shared a meal together if people were available. Well, it was a beautiful thing. We did training on Monday, and it was great, and we worked together, and we fixed some things and made it better for the first day of BBS. The second day, we had an even better day. It was the first day with the kids. There was chaos, but we made things work. God was clearly in the mix. And then we had lunch, and it was great. And we wrapped up for the day, we prayed, and we headed off for day three. For many of us, day three began early in the morning, long before we expected to be up, because, now I'm going to say some words. I hope they don't shake your faith, but three words come to mind, food poisoning and diarrhea, okay? Something in some food that we served affected over half of the staff. Um, and most of us were up most of the night before. And also had to adjust in what we were doing here. So it was kind of tag team leadership to make a quick run for the bathroom. Now, if you've ever had food poisoning, you know how unpleasant that is. And yet, most everybody when they first showed up didn't even show signs of it. They were ready to go. And, but I started asking them, hey, did you have any problems last night? No, nothing of consequence. I had a little hard time sleeping. I said, okay, let's be honest. Did you have diarrhea? Okay. And it was, again, over half of our staff was affected. But the kids, I don't think, ever knew. Because everybody was there, backstopping each other, making sure we always had two-person or better control of the kids, because that's part of our child care policy, but also for their benefit and for others. But people had a greater mission. They wanted to love on the kids and share Jesus with them, and they knew they were needed. They knew that they were there for a reason. So many places I've been where you've had church people, what we would have gotten is, um, oh, sorry, can't make it. Sorry, sorry. You know, because they were priority. Now, to be fair, some people, some of our most immune compromised people, um, one girl who actually was a member, she was a family member of a helper uh, who had a heart transplant, was so sick she couldn't come. And one of our older members was so sick she couldn't come. But everybody else made it, believe it or not. Um, so that was nigh on too miraculous. But it, to me, really showed the working of, um, you know, a changed heart, a changed life. And to be fair, Think about what you tell the average cook that something you fed somebody gave them food poisoning. Many people will blow up at you. It can't be my food. It wasn't my stuff. Ugh. Our kitchen staff went, wow. Boy, I hope it wasn't something we did. But here's what we're going to do. We threw out every bit of food, and they scrubbed the entire kitchen with a Clorox solution so that everything was clean. Some stuff that probably hadn't been clean in a long time, like under counters and everything else. They just went to town and they worked really hard and we didn't have any more problems. But that was a great opportunity to go through a trial and to see did we focus on me or did we focus on mission, did we press on. God in all of this, in the midst of it, even there but even before, provided workers, he provided supplies, he had you know the kids come. There was a point at which in May we were going, are we going to have a BBS? But we started praying more in earnest and God provided the workers. God provided ways for supplies to come in, even just nice things, you know, stuff that was fun, completely irrelevant to the gospel, but it was fun for the kids. They liked it, right? 
and it was a good talking point for them too. And then there was safety. We didn't have any major accidents. Got answered in all kinds of ways as far as the team recovering from the food poisoning. And there was opportunity to share with the kids. They listened, they heard, and it was because people were steadfast and they shared their faith in the process. So in James 1.4, we read some more about being steadfast, didn't we? And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Well, the idea of us being perfect on earth is, sounds crazy, but God is the one who's perfecting us. And as we stay with him, as we are steadfast, he continues to work that ultimately, you know, one day we'll stand before the Lord and everything will be fully completed. But that lacking in nothing is also important. We just talked about how God provided for us, for the programs, for the kids, through many, some who just shared food and some who purchased supplies who couldn't come and others who were there all the time, and some who were there part of the time, some who wanted to be but couldn't because of injury. They were praying. So God was really at work. We were lacking in nothing. And all of us who were involved, I believe, grew as well. Do we still find lack? Sure. We still worry. We still have some fear, but we're reminded a little bit more, why am I carrying this? Why don't I turn it over to the Lord? And that's part of that process of being perfect and complete and lacking in nothing as we grow closer and closer to Him, right? And that's just some of the team. That was part of the learning process. Get them in orderly fashion. Then we go over to verses 5 through 12. I'll read some of those. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, whom gives generously, but let him ask in faith. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, the rich in his humiliation. Why was that in that section? Because both are in Christ. It's the brother part that's important, not the richest part. Then down in 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And we don't do it for the trial, or we don't do it for the crown, we do it for the love of God, and God simply recognizes what he's been doing with that crown. It's not a big jeweled crown. The picture is of a little wreath, just like a runner in the Olympics. It says, well done, you've run the race. And then in verse 2-1, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord of glory. We had kids from different races, different ethnic groups, different religious backgrounds, different um, uh, ages, genders, uh, economic groups. It didn't really matter. But I've seen programs in churches where, well, you're not the right color. You're not the right economic group. You're a little too much of this or a little too little of that. That's not how Jesus works, is it? He's not a, um, he doesn't really care about the trappings. He knows who people are at the heart and he calls us to love them too. And that's what we were seeing. We were boasting in Christ because of the godly wisdom he had given us, not only with his word and the truth we had there, but the truth he was giving us with kids. There were a number of times we prayed about it, and God gave us great answers to better reach some of these kids. We had one little guy who, uh, okay, um, who had left, who, oh, who had come, who had just changed between um, one family who was, oh, oh, that's right, his parents were divorced. And he was really struggling, right? Actually, there was a couple of kids that way. And because they had just had their transition day. And trying to reach them, when they were so torn up about some of what was going on, you know, that really took wisdom and it took love. And it showed through. And a lot of that happened in small group time, too, where these leaders would very selflessly spend time with kids Sometimes being even a little daunted by what was going on. And, um, and yet they prayed and God led and it was good. In 17 and 18, what do we see? In 17 and 18, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. God provided through all of this. He's the giver of good gifts. You know, the first and most important gift really, you might say, is life, but even more so eternal life. Um, we get to be blessed by it, and then we get excited to share with others. We saw a lot of that. There was a lot of opportunity to serve. You know, and James talks here about being a kind of first fruits. Jesus was the first fruit. We who have come to know him are first fruits, but everybody 
who comes to know him are first fruits. So first fruits, seeking more fruits, first fruits, encouraging the truth, sharing the love, leading the kids. And we don't know what these kids will take away. We hope that they know they were loved, they cared for, and that, that truth stays in there, that God will use it. Some of them will have come to know the Lord, some will. Some it may take decades, but we trust that God is at work. We invest for the future, right? Not for the past, for the future. Here's one of the little guys, you know Titan. He was having a hard time. What are we called to do? James says, hey, in the midst of all this, in James 19 and 26, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If anyone thinks he's religious and not, does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This person's religion is worthless. One of the things a lot of kids don't get is anybody listening to them, right? I mean, parents, we're busy and it's really easy. We think we listen, but a lot of times we're just trying to get through the day and get everything taken care of. At school, a lot of times kids aren't listened to. And this is part of why they begin following the pack. If anybody listens, it tends to be somebody in the pack that's their age, and they become the one who most influences them. But the ones who hear can better respond and can encourage. You know, you can think, you can pray, and you can speak into their lives. James is going to warn us in chapter 3, be careful what your tongue does. Don't let hell set it on fire, because that's what most humans are doing most of the time when they're seeking themselves. But he says, seek godly righteousness. Anger isn't going to do it for you. But God's work in your life will. And then we're reminded, you know, put away the things that will defile and that will dishonor God. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Receive God's work with meekness. That implanted word, right? And also show meekness. I thought this was a great example of meekness. One of our youngest and one of our oldest together, right? As Cora's being watched so that mom can work. Jan at this point was taking care of her. Abby had had her for a while. Other people were taking care of her in between shifts. Um, the world would tell you that Cora's not worth much and that Jan's not worth much. That's a horrendous lie. Horrendous lie. I think they're both adorable. But more importantly, God says they're about it. They're made in his image. He has a purpose for them and for all the rest of us too. He says, receive that in meekness. And essentially, we're, we're told elsewhere, more so, to live out a life in meekness submitted to God, right? God is the one who's going to save our souls. And by the way, it's not being doers that saves us. Being doers reflects, just like Cash was talking about, that relationship of being a friend, of being loved. And, you know, then we read also... Um, in 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. Those are very specific things that go on from what James has said. But the very general thing is to care for others, to love others, right? And some of that requires us not to defile ourselves or dishonor God by, a lot of times, just self-worship. What about me? I'm the God of my life. And if the God of the universe can join in, great. But if he can't, well, I mean, really? Do we want to worship that puny, false God of ourselves? You know, and we don't want to dance to the tune of our enemies, the enemies of our soul, the world of flesh and devil, but it's so easy. We don't want to rule by our law. And frankly, we don't want to abuse God's law. But we don't want to assume that there is no place for us to do the right thing. There is a right thing. God does lay some of this out for us. Like, watch your tongue. But God, as we submit, as we are in meekness, transforms our lives through that implanted word. You know, we share the word of God that transforms others in our lives first. In our word second, right? Whenever we get that backwards, whenever we think we're going to talk our way out of a something without a life that matches. What is the church always accused of? And quite rightly so. Hypocrites. Well, now the truth is every human being I've ever met is a hypocrite, right? But do we don't want to practice that. We want to be more like Christ. And so our lives need to be there first. Our words should follow, right? Out of the abundance of the heart come the words. They abound. They, they pour out. 
But we receive in meekness, right? We receive what God has for us in meekness. We share in meekness. And that's part of love. It's living out love. It's receiving love. It's giving love. Anyway, this is one of my favorite pictures from me. And so we've been talking about this. We've used this final slide for a couple weeks now. But God is transforming us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. What do we see in VBS that's like life? To live life. To enjoy what God has given us. To be in joy even in trials. To share the truth in love. Just sharing the truth or just sharing love leaves out what God really wants. His truth in love. The way Jesus did. And to rejoice always. And remember, I love the passage where God says, and again I say, rejoice. Even in trials. God loves you. That's what we told the kids. Jesus died for you. That's how you know God loves you. That's how you can be in relationship with God. And we love you because of Jesus. Not because we're superhumans, but because God showed love to us that we're unlovable. And we're showing it to you. This is really the fundamental truth of the gospel right there. How do you live that out? You've got to know the truth in relationship with Christ. Know his word. You don't have to have every bit of it memorized because Jesus made it really simple and really hard. Remember when he said, there are two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your might. And the second is unto this, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these. They're completed in these. That doesn't mean that we're not responsible for the Ten Commandments. But you know, you're not going to murder your neighbor when you love them. You're not going to steal from your neighbor when you love them. You're not going to lie to your neighbor or somebody else when you love them. Simple and hard, right? Because what does Jesus say? You've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I say, if you hate someone in your mind, in your heart, you've murdered them already. Oof. Love. And how do we go for find love? In him. In Christ. Anyway, that's the message. That's what I saw in work in in VBS, and there were so many great stories, seeing groups come together. One day there was one leader who was struggling, and so she asked another leader, hey, I'm not really prepared, will you help me today? And so they merged their groups, and it worked well. There were others who jumped in and helped when there wasn't a helper. There were others who stood up and ran crafts, for example, when we needed somebody to run crafts, even before anybody said it. And that's a great picture of the body of Christ working together. It was the Big C Church, because we had multiple churches who cared about kids who wanted to work together. It was the Little C Church, and that we were in this little body together, in this space together, caring for one another. That's what the church should be doing. That's what we should be striving for, always knowing that it relies first and foremost on God. And God reminds us of this. Again, we used this last week, too. We're to be copying Him. We're to be like Jesus. We even use the idea from um, C.S. Lewis of good pretending, right? Living as best we can the life of Jesus, gospel doing lives, another person called it. It's not about our work. It's about living that life of reconciliation. As Rigney, this is the quote I had last week too, it's not simply what would Jesus do? That's often too abstract and distant. It's what should I do if I were full of Jesus? And that's where we saw, for example, in James and in Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit. So copy him, take up your cross, and follow me. That's a day-to-day thing. So that a prayer like this may be one that really applies to us. May I speak each word as if my last word, and walk each step as my final one. If my life should end today, let this be my best day. We don't want to be killing time. There isn't enough time. The richest man or woman in the world cannot buy more time. But God has given us opportunities, even in the little things. Even like our little praiseworthy friend earlier, right? What a blessing. We've had people who walk in this church and go, Oh, I'm so disappointed. Move along. Go someplace else. God gave us little ones and old ones and everybody in between to love and to care for, and we will all have problems. There is not one of us who is perfect in this side of heaven. Love those God has given you. And if it means changing their diaper, practically, a lot, or metaphorically, we have that too with adults, as you well know, right? 
live the best day. What are you going to do today that makes it the best day? First and foremost thing is to rely upon God and say, God, where do you want me to go today? I really need your help because I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling sick. I'm feeling sore. I'm feeling lost. I'm feeling unloved. Whatever the lies that you're receiving, God is the place to go for the answers. And for the love that you need, first and foremost. It doesn't matter what the world calls us. It doesn't matter what our friends call us or our ex-friends or our pseudo-friends or our family. What does God say? I love you. I care for you. And in case you doubt it, I sent Jesus to show you. I encourage you to hide some of those in your heart and think about them and pray about them. And while we're talking about prayer, let's go ahead and do that. Father, may we indeed learn to grow in you, to rely upon you, to speak each word as if it was our last, each step as if it were our last, that we might take joy and we might see things happen because we're investing in what's valuable. And it doesn't matter how old they are or how young they are or how simple the task, Lord, we can do it in love in a way that honors you. May we do so. We've got so much to learn and so much to grow. But first and foremost, Father, may we grow in an understanding of your love for us and help us to grow in love for each other so that it's not us we're worshiping on the idol of our li- on the altar of our lives, but in fact it's you. May you work mightily in each life here. Father, may you tear down the lies that have obstructed and hindered, Father, and confused. And may you be exalted. We commit all this to you. May the dross that I added be removed. And may the truth be emphasized by your spirit. May you be exalted. And we all over for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As strange as it may seem, God does love us. Even when we feel unlovable. Even when we feel distant. Even when we're angry with God, God loves us. As long as we're here, we have an opportunity. If you have questions, comments, concerns, prayer requests, contact us here. In the meantime, we're praying for you. Praying God bless you. We pray for us.